and welcome to our final conversation. Um, you have stayed with us, prayed with us, and worked really hard um, on this topic of forgiveness, uh, which is commanded um, by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He taught us much about forgiveness in our Lord's Prayer, um, about forgiving our enemies, forgiving those who willfully used us. He um, tied our forgiveness to the forgiveness we desire from our Heavenly Father. He said, if we were unwilling or unable to forgive others, that even so our Heavenly Father would be also unable to forgive us our trespasses and sins. And so we see it as a very um, <clears throat> cornerstone, com cornerstone command as to what God requires us living out our faith as believers and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, however, if you've lived long enough in the earth, uh, we know that there are a lot of egregious, a lot of painful experiences that hurt us, that hurt us deeply, um, that even as we try to apply forgiveness, cause us as we're wrestling with the uh, residue emotions and impact and loss, uh, cause us to struggle over and over again um, with those issues. And um, we wanted to bring to you someone who's living forgiveness as the last chapter of the book talks about by Lisa Torkust. Um, it speaks about living forgiveness, chapter 14. And, um, and we were privileged to be in the studio speaking about that future um, event of um, dealing with that scripture and um, had the opportunity and the good fortune. We actually believe it's, it was um, being orchestrated by God um, for Dr. Carolyn uh, Miller to know uh, Kent Whitaker, who's um, lived forgiveness in our current context um, in ways that uh, sometimes it's hard to wrap your mind around and imagine. And so we are honored and privileged that he's taking the opportunity to be with us this evening and to speak openly and frankly, uh, both to our host and to you, our viewing, viewing audience. Uh, Kent Whitaker story has attracted um, leading media attention. Uh, it has been examined in, in, in many ways, both uh, based on the event and and events after the event um, as well um, by Oprah by 2020, um, by um, radio and, and so many other um, platforms. But we are absolutely delighted uh, to have him with us. And one of the things that resonates with me more than anything else is that Kent is a man of faith uh, who truly believes in the sovereignty of God and the hand of God in his life. And his life is one not only of living out unconditional love and forgiveness, but one of overcoming uh, tragedy and actually experiencing triumph and coming into those fresh and um, restored season that God speaks so clearly about. And so help me welcome um, Kent Whitaker um, to our conversations this evening, along with our host, Dr. Carolyn Miller and Dr. Reba Richardson. Could you give him a hand if you can? Yes, hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome, so we're so happy yeah. to have you. Thank you. Happy you're here. Uh, Pastor Carl, let me ask you, uh, uh, before we get started, one of these things I'd like to overcome is the fact that I don't have a screen going on right now. Um, is everyone able to see me? Because I, I'll all I've got is a blank screen with a advertisement for Zoom. Yes, yeah, we can actually see you very well. Uh, we can okay. see you, yes, your face. We see you touching your chin. So. Um, I think if you if you change your view option. Okay. Like they have an option at the top where you can put multiple people up one time. I'm looking for that. It's usually at the very top of the the screen. Can you see? Uh, can you see the participants' names? I all I see is a, a single small black box that right now has got Craig M on it. But I don't. There are no no other. All I have is a white screen with an advertisement about more than meetings. Discover how you can elevate the way you work by combining webinar, etc. Um, um, and so this just came up at, right there at the very start when uh, Pastor Carl started his prayer. Just when you move, if, if we can't, uh, I'll just talk to the the little lady in the 
commercial. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if we can um, help you with that. And we get to see who you're talking to. <laughs> Yeah, nice uh, so let me understand. You're using a computer. You're logged in that way on Zoom, yes? Yes. Okay. Um, and you should be able. You should see um, on the participants. Uh, I guess if you move your mouse on the screen, what happens? You, does anything pop up? Uh, no. You got a Mac? Is that a Mac? You're using a Mac. I'm, use, I'm using the mic in the computer, I suppose. That's a Mac computer, uh, Apple? Yes, it's a Mac. I have a question. Um, do you see, so you said you're seeing a little black box and every time somebody talks, their name comes up, right? So you could see a mic, a camera, and then a little arrow thing next to it? I do, I do see so, that. So click the arrow all the way at the end. The arrow what? Click the last symbol that you see after the camera. Okay. Oh, I think you just fixed it. All right, great. <laughs> All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Those are the Mac users here. <laughs> oh. All right. Now you should yeah. see the participants. Can you see the names of the participants? I do. I can. Okay. Wonderful. Good. Okay. Perfect. Well, uh, we thank. Uh, we are thankful. Um, for that opportunity that now you're able to see us. And as I open us up in prayer, then we will um, we'll get, go ahead and get started with our discussion. So Heavenly Father and God, we thank you. We thank you, O oh God, that we have this opportunity to come before, um, before you, O oh God, with our prayers and our opportunity to have this um, meeting tonight where we can share one with another. Truly what you desire for each and every one of us, your followers, you desire for us to to practice and to, to forgive because you have forgiven us so many things, including our sins, oh God. So we ask, oh God, that you be with us tonight as we talk, as we um, we frankly discuss the experience, um, the personal experience of Kent and his family. And we pray, oh God, that from this discussion tonight, that those of us who have struggled um, with, the, with the decision to forgive, that we will be able to realize that, that it is a possible thing, it's possible to live forgiveness. And may we also, oh God, be willing to accept Extend forgiveness one to another as you have done to us. Be with us all, O oh God. We thank you, O oh God, for just aligning us tonight to make this possible. And we pray it'll be a fruitful discussion. Just then I pray. Amen. 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 So Kenneth joining us from um, Sugarland in Houston, in Houston, Texas. And we're so happy to have you. He's currently part of a, a ministry that's affecting many, many lives. Um, bigger picture ministry is that he does with his wife, Tanya. And um, they've traveled across the world teaching people about forgiveness, hope, and healing. Uh, so we're happy to have you. And um, one of the things, Ken, is that there's so many people who are struggling, um, who has been hurt, um, similar to your story, and um, that are on the line with us, both by Facebook and Zoom. Um, in our culture, there's gun violence, and people have been marred by gun violence. They've been marred by um, domestic violence sometimes by close uh, relatives and friends. And we struggle, even though we know that the scriptures speak about forgiveness. There's a lot of beautiful scriptures that many of us have um, committed to memory mm -hmm. that um, guides us into that area. But the real life application of doing it is, is really, really hard. And so I, I want you to begin by sharing your story. And starting with the night of December 10, 2003, um, when you are out um, celebrating with your family at Papados, okay. one of my favorite restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, but before I jump into that, I just want to uh, assure everyone that is um, on this podcast that by the time we're through, you will have the tools that you need to truly forgive someone. You will have seen how it works. You will have a better understanding about why it is so hard to do. Um, and the awesome thing is, the answer is that our job is to just ask God to do it, which you'll see as we go through this. But I just want to assure everybody that all of those horrible things that have happened in your life that are so difficult to forgive, um, they're still going to be hard. But the thing is, God will be doing the heavy lifting and not you. So... I, I'm so excited to visit with you all. Um, 
even though the story is sad, uh, it begins for me in uh, on December 10th of 2003, when my wife Trisha called to say that our older son Bart had finished his um, his college exams and, and wanted to go out and celebrate his upcoming graduation. So we went out to Papa Do's restaurant, which is a restaurant here in, in, in Houston that uh, serves Cajun food, Louisiana type seafood, and a wonderful meal. But when we came back, uh, my younger son, Kevin, uh, stepped to the front door and, and opened it and walked into the dark house. There was a loud noise and uh, my wife, Tricia said, oh no, and then there was another loud noise. Now, I, I've been around guns all my life. In fact, I own several, but I honestly did not recognize those sounds as gunshots. The idea that there might be an assassin in my own home was just so bizarre that it didn't, it didn't even register. Uh, so uh, after the second shot, uh, I stepped up to look inside to see what was happening. And um, I saw a man standing there, maybe six or seven feet away, very close with a ski mask on, but it still didn't make any sense. Uh, my first thought actually was, I wonder which one of Kevin's goofball friends is playing a trick on us with the paintball gun because that's the sort of thing that could happen in our house. <laughs> Lots of pranks. The next moment I was hit in the chest uh, hard and I fell back on the front porch and I couldn't get up. And that was when I realized that those sounds had been gunshots and there had been three of them, one for each of us. And uh, I called out to my family trying to find out what was happening, uh, but I got no answers, uh, except for some quiet, wet coughs coming from Tricia. Now, I'd never heard those kind of coughs before, but instinctively I knew that they were the sound of someone trying to clear their lungs from filling with blood. I, I suspect that there might be some people who are, who are listening um, who have experienced the possibility of imminent death, but for me, it was, uh, it was quite peaceful. Uh, I, I told God, I know I'm dying. If this is my time to die, I'm fine with that. But to please protect my family. And uh, so I called out again and still no answer. Um, then the police were there all of a sudden. Um, and following them, the paramedics, and two of them began working on me, trying to keep me alive. Uh, but nobody would tell me anything about my family until I overheard uh, two policemen as they rushed into the house. What do you want to do about the DOA? And I knew what that meant, dead on arrival. And that's how I learned that at least one, and I didn't know maybe by now all of my family had died. I began to shake and realized that I was going into shock. Well, Tricia and I were taken by two life flight helicopters to the medical center in Houston. And Bart joined me a few minutes later by ambulance. Later, I learned that they had actually stopped working on Tricia about halfway through the flight and that Kevin had died almost instantly right inside our front door. Well, Later that night, when the police left and the nurses left and the family left and I was by myself, uh, I was struggling with my faith. My emotions were all over the place, but um, they always came back to this deep desire for revenge because I just wanted to hurt this person who had stolen my entire life. Uh, and I was mad at God, too. I can't tell you. I was so angry at him, not just for letting it happen, but for seemingly to lie to me. Because um, there's a verse in the Bible, Romans 8, 28, that's been one of my favorite for a, a long time. And I've used it many times when I uh, were, was consoling friends who were going on through something hard. And 
but I couldn't apply it to myself. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. The verse says, and we know that in all things, God will work them all things to good for those who love him and are called to his service. And I'm thinking, well, could that even apply here? Could God take the murders of my wife and son and the near murder from me and work it for good? And I couldn't see any way that he could do that. Uh, I said, you know, God, that's a lie. That you cannot do that. You cannot take this and work it for good. And I wondered what else was I believing that would turn out to be a lie just when I needed it. You know, I was faced with the decision. Either I threw the Bible out completely and just made, made life as best I could on my own, or choose to trust that God would work something out for good, even though it didn't make any sense at all. Well, I knew that I needed God more now than I ever had in my life. And I also knew that I had argued for years that faith in anything is an act of willpower. It doesn't have anything to do with our thoughts or our feelings or our emotions because they'll lie to us. They'll get us to make bad decisions. Faith is, well, in, in the Christian, from a Christian's point of view, faith is when you know what the Bible says, but it doesn't make sense. And yet you choose to trust God, to, to be faithful and to follow through with what he's promised. And so I chose to do that. I told God, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I am going to trust you to an act of willpower, basically, that you are going to work this for good for somebody, somewhere, somehow. And the instant that I made that decision and settled that in my mind, the first of two very strange things happened. The first was that I got a specific word for word sentence come into my mind. Now, most of the time God speaks to me the way he does with most people. I'll be uh, praying and uh, there'll be a still quiet voice that pops into my mind. Uh, or I'll be reading the Bible and a verse will just pop out with an answer to uh, something I've been wrestling with. You've probably experienced that as well. But tonight, he gave me a specific sense and it was good. Now, what about the shooter? Which really threw me. I had no idea what he was talking about, but I heard it clearly. But as I thought about it for a minute, I realized that what God was doing was he was, uh, he was encouraging me for trusting him in the Romans 8.28 thing. And he was asking, are you going to trust me with the other hard things, the really hard things, things like vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Oh, and I, it hit me. I knew what he was going to ask me. He was going to ask me to forgive this guy. And I knew I couldn't do it. I didn't want to do it. But at the same time, <laughs> I needed God now more than I ever had in my life. And so I said, Father, uh, it's clear to me that you want me to forgive this person, but you know my heart. You know I don't want to do this, and I, and I don't know how to do this. I can't do this. What I'm going to do is rely on some of the things, some of the other Bible verses that I learned, which was, you know, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Uh, and, and with God, all things are possible. And I said, here's an opportunity for you to prove these true. I'm going to ask you to help me forgive this person. But if you want me to, you're going to have to do all the hard work. All I'm able to do, Lord, is to ask you to help me. And the instant that that happened, the really strange thing happened. And I cannot explain that. I really, all I can say is it felt like a, a warm golden glow that kind of flowed over me like a, like a golden fog that just kind of covered my body with little 
sparkles on it. And I don't even know if I'm remembering this right, but it flowed over my body and then it was gone. And when it left, it took with it all of that hatred, all of that desire for revenge. And in its place was a complete forgiveness for everyone or anyone who had, was involved in this. And that terrified me. I had never heard of anything like this. I'd never experienced anything like this. And I wondered, is this really happening? Uh, is this a reaction, a psychological reaction to the trauma? Is this the, the drugs in the, the drip in my arm? Or is that what it is? But I, I, was, I had my facilities, I was very conscious and I, and I could tell, I knew that this was something that was real. This had actually happened, even though I didn't understand it or explain it. But then on the other hand, I couldn't understand or explain why I was still alive because I should have died that night. There's no question about it. Well, the next morning, I began to see what God may be up to here because the police told me that they had found out that Bart was not about to graduate from college at all. In fact, he hadn't even been enrolled that semester. And without actually saying so, I knew that he had now become um, their number one suspect for arranging the murders. And I'm sure they thought it was because of, of failures in school or something like that. Um, but now we know that uh, there was a serious mental illness at play here, but we didn't know that at the time. We didn't realize that. Uh, and I didn't believe at all that he was responsible or could have had anything to do with it. But I did know that Bart's faith was not as strong as Trish's or Kevin's or mine. And if he was going to be the focus of an investigation that might actually lead to a trial one day, I knew he needed someone in his corner, someone who would walk through this with him, someone who could display the unconditional love God has because if he was responsible in any way for this, he needed to know that with repentance, God forgives whatever we do. So uh, as I was laying there thinking about it, I realized that the, um, the, the, the miracle forgiveness that I had received that night would allow me to display that kind of love for Bart. Because when I went home from the hospital, uh, I did so knowing that Bart might have actually been responsible for the deaths of his mother and brother. But I came home without any sense of fear or judgment. And that would have been impossible if I had not received that gift of that the miracle forgiveness on the night of the shootings. I thought about it and I realized that what it reminded me of was the uh, parable that Jesus told in Luke 15 about the prodigal son. And you probably know the story about a young man who asked for his inheritance early and leaves home for a life of wine, women, and song, soon blows through all of his money. But his dad, who still loves him, even though he is quite aware of the folly, has been praying that he would come to his senses and return. And when he did, when the boy returned home, the father forgave him and welcomed him back into the family. And that, of course, is what the parable was used to de describe how, how God the Father unconditionally loves and forgives us. And the story was an example of how God forgives everyone. And I realized that uh, thanks to that gift, the night of the shootings of the unexpected forgiveness that I could actually be the prodigal son's dad in real life. Well, several months went by, the police were closing in and one night Bart went downstairs out the front door and out of my life. I didn't know where he'd gone. 
Later, I found out that he'd run off to the mountains of Mexico. And 15 months after he ran away, he was arrested and brought back to Texas to face trial. And even though I and uh, all of my family and all of Trisha's family pleaded for 18 months for the district attorney to accept two back-to-back 40-year -back sentences in return for Bart's um, guilty plea, they wouldn't back away from pursuing the death penalty. So in 2008, he was, uh, or 2007, I guess it was, uh, he was convicted of arranging the murders and sentenced to die. Um, Ken. Yeah, you talk about somebody who without hope. Uh, my, whole life, my whole life was a bag of broken glass at that point. Yes. Um, Brother Ken. Yes. I, I have a question for you. Uh, to take us back, it seemed like you made a decision to forgive before you knew who the um, offenders were. Is that, is, is, yes. am I understanding you correctly? Yes, I did not have any idea who was responsible, who that person behind the mask was. I didn't have any uh, enemies that I knew of. I, I just, I could not imagine who would have done this thing. Uh, but it wasn't, but that's the gist of it, Pastor. But the truth is, it wasn't a decision I made to forgive. Because what the decision I made was, to trust God in Romans 8, 28. And he wanted me to forgive. And uh, so really the one thing I did right was to trust that the Bible meant what it said in a time when it didn't appear like it, 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 it should be true. But so, yes, it, it, all that happened before I found out that Bart was involved at all. Okay. So, um, so just for the for clarification, so you made the decision to forgive. Yes. But um, but but from what we learned, it's, it's actually like a twofold process. You first you make the decision, and then after that, you you know you have to still deal with emotions and everything else that yes. goes along with having to forgive. And as you just mentioned, this is actually your child. So you have two, you know, you have both the fact that someone did something bad, no, it's not to be your child. So I'm sure that emotions that went along with that. Um, sometimes it probably might have been difficult to still stay in that mindset that I'm forgiven because, you know, you got the news or he left and he's now um, in Mexico or whatever else is happening. How was that for you? You know, what, would you find like you were forgiven and then stop from forgiven and forgiven, forgiven again, or you were able to maintain that forgiveness um, all the way through? You know, the, uh, the way that I, I knew for sure that uh, it was that it was a true, complete forgiveness as a result of God's action in my life. The way I knew that was because I never once have relapsed and, and felt, ang not angry, because I have, <laughs> I've been very angry at my son, but it wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a, a desire for revenge type of anger at all. It was a, it was a true forgiveness and it was complete. Uh, now, most of us, <laughs> I never heard of this. Uh, I have since heard of uh, this happening to two other people, but uh, I had never heard of it. And so most of the time, people who forgive have to do it the old fashioned way. And I'm going to give you guys some tools in a few minutes uh, that you can use to help you forgive. And I'm going to go through some insights as to what forgiveness is and what it isn't and some of the misconceptions we have uh, so that we all understand forgiveness a lot better. But in answer to your question, I have, uh, I have never uh, slipped back into uh, needing to ask God to help me forgive again on that. Uh, a question I have, it seems like you and Bart was living together um, for 15 months before you ran off to Mexico. Well, it wasn't that long. It was from December to uh, the 1st of July. So he was, he and I were living in our house for seven months. The police hadn't arrested him. They hadn't told him not to go anywhere. Uh, the investigation was ongoing. Uh, but uh, in answer to uh, Dr. Reva's question, 
there were many times when I was angry at Bart and I told him, I don't know who's telling me the truth. The police were trying to convince me that he was involved. He was responsible for the shooting. Bart was telling me he wasn't involved. And I told both of them, says, I don't know who's telling the truth and who's lying. God knows, and the person who is lying knows. But I am not going to abandon my son simply because the police tell me I should. I will tell the, the police if I see anything, if I learn of anything, uh, I will tell the police about it. But I am not going to leave my son just because they want to pin this on somebody. And you said you and him was back in our house. Yes. I imagine that, is this the same house where yes. your wife and your other son had died? Yes. Many okay. people ask how we could have done that. And I'm honestly not sure how Bart did it, all things considered. But for me, I didn't know what it was going to be like when I drove up or well, when my brother drove us home from the hospital uh, and I got to the house, I wasn't sure I would be able to go in, but I found that I was able to. And I walked in and uh, everything had been put back like it should have been. Uh, the, we had some friends who came in and removed all the carpet that had the blood on it and uh, replaced everything like it like it needed to be. And so it was like we hadn't ever left. And all I can say is that we had lived in that house for nearly 30 years. And it was a house that was full of love, full of laughter, full of really great memories. And we had one horrible night and uh, that was forever a part of that story. But uh, I did not feel a need to um, to go somewhere else. As strange as that is, I, I, it was my house, and uh, and I used the uh, the familiarity of it to help me heal. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just curious: is that a house you still live in today? No, <laughs> no. Uh, later on in the story, you're going to find out. Yeah, I fell in love again, and I got oh, married. Yeah. Uh, and when we got married, I still own that house. Yeah. Uh, but I told her, I said, listen, we're not starting our life there. Right. And so uh, we put it up on the market and uh, we sold it and we bought another house here in Sugarland. That's that. Yeah, we're we're going to soon let the audience uh, participate. But the question I have is you talked about struggling between wanting to believe Bob and having all of these um, discoveries from the police about his potential or possible involvement. When did you accept the um, reality mm. uh, um, reasonably? When did you begin to accept the reality that he um, could have been the mastermind behind um, arranging for yes. um, the death of his other family members, which includes your wife, your other son, and yourself? Yes. I actually came to the conclusion that it was possible that he had been involved in some way. I didn't know if it was that he'd gotten into a gambling debt with somebody and had agreed to leave the house open and we came home and, and disturbed the burglary. I mean, that was one scenario I thought of, but I knew that it was possible that I came to the conclusion that it was possible that he was re responsible in some way for it uh, pretty early on. But that didn't change the fact that God allowed me to live that night and one of the reasons I believe that he allowed me to live was so I could display God's unconditional love to him. Because if he had been, if he was responsible, and, and, and later on he told me how this rocked his world, that I was able to do this. But uh, I knew that if he was responsible, he needed someone to display so that he would have hope that God would actually forgive him. I did not want, I love my son. He did something really horrible and it changed my life forever. But that doesn't change the fact that he's my son. And so um, 
I don't remember exactly what your question was, but oh, you, you answered my question. Okay. And I guess the other thought I have is what was your faith like before this unfortunate event? And what was your experience uh, with, with forgiveness before having to oh. apply it to this situation? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I grew up in a Christian household and uh, I never doubted that I was a Christian, but that didn't mean I was a very practicing Christian. Uh, I went to church, but uh, quite a, a lot of my life uh, decisions were not made after prayer. Let me put it that way. And in particular in college, I was, uh, uh, I played around some. And, uh, but as I, it, things change when you have children. And uh, when, when we had Bart and later when we had Kevin, we started going back to church uh, more regularly. And I got involved with church more regularly. And we started giving more regularly. And my faith grew, it grew a lot. And I entered, was introduced by, to uh, some friends uh, who believed that the Bible was inerrant, which was uh, a little different from the liberal denomination that I grew up in. And they showed me how the Bible hung together and, and explained itself, if I would just trust it to mean what it said. And so I started memorizing Bible scriptures. And as a result, I had, I had used Romans 8.28 uh, in the past. So um, it was natural that I would think about that on the night of the shooting. So there was a progression. I can see how, how my faith had grown and grown and grown. But I'll tell you what, as a result of the uh, trial and as a result of Bart disappearing and all of the things since, uh, my faith has grown in a huge way. The forgiveness part of it, I just, I struggled with forgiveness all my life. You know, I could sometimes forgive somebody if it was little enough, but if it was something big, I couldn't forgive them. I didn't know how to, nobody taught me how. And I wondered, you know, is there something wrong with me that I, I can't forgive? I mean, the Bible tells me I'm supposed to, and yet, um, am I just not trying hard enough? But, um, I learned the night of the shootings, the secret to forgiveness. And that is that it is not something you can do by just trying harder. This isn't something that you can do on your own. I think forgiveness is the, the most godlike thing that we ever are called to do. And we're not God. We don't have his power uh, in, our own, in our own self, but we have access to his power. And uh, so if we are going to truly forgive, it requires us to submit ourselves to his commandment to do something that we really don't want to do and doesn't make sense from a human perspective. It's a matter of uh, submitting our will to his and trusting that he will be faithful in what he's promised to do. So I'm sure some of you in the audience might have a question um, for um, Ken at this time. So we'll allow you, a few of you to ask a question before we move on. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? And listen, uh, if you have a question, I, I'll try to answer it. I, I, I don't think I've ever ducked one yet. So <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Yeah. Lack. Go ahead. I have a question. Yeah. Hi, my name is Margaret Price. I'm from St. Thomas, U.S. Uh -huh. Virgin Island. And I was uh, talking to Dr. Richardson earlier, and I explained to her that my husband got murdered a long time ago, and we never found the person who did it. So how can you forgive when you don't even know who to forgive? Well, you know, if you think about it, the night of the shootings, I didn't know who I was forgiving. Now, I admittedly, it was a it was a miracle forgiveness that God stepped in. He knew I had to have 
the forgiveness out of the way before I found out the next day that my son may have been responsible. But all I can tell you is that, first of all, I am so sorry for your loss because that that has left a, an open wound there that has never healed. But the true answer to healing is to tell God that you want to forgive this person, that they not minimizing what they took from you by any means. I truly, if anybody understands your loss, I do. And it's not, uh, it's not about the other person having to say anything or even know who they are. Forgiveness is a one-way street between you and God. It's you telling God, I'm going to let go of this, asking you to take care, to, 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 to uh, extend judgment as you feel is best. And I am going to turn it over to you so that I can start something new. And we're going to, believe me, in a, in a couple of minutes, we're going to go through some steps and we're going to go explain the whole thing about forgiveness and about hatred that stays in your heart. Uh, a lot of this will make a little more sense in a minute, but I am just, I'm very sorry for your loss, especially that you don't have a, don't have any idea who's responsible. That, uh, that's awful. And I'm so sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Good evening. Mm. I think I understood. Um, as I sit here with kind of like mixed emotions, like mm -hmm. I lost my sister in 9 11. And every time I say I lost her, I think that just like that lady just um, described. She doesn't need anything to forgive. So I think that every time we say we lost our loved one in 9-11, we're kind of in denial to say they were murdered. Yeah. Um, and not lost. Yeah. Um, I think that kind of goes hand in hand with not knowing who to forgive or even the thought of forgiveness. Really. 9-11 was so chaotic. Um, I think I understood when you talked about that warm feeling. And someone once told me, while I was in the midst of being really angry at someone uh, and not wanting to give that person ammunition to say, oh, you see, look how Christians act. The person that made me so mad. And suddenly, this warm wind, and I went from being very, very, very angry to peaceful and really had this weird peace. And someone told me that was the Holy Ghost that visited me. And so I when you said that, I understood. Yes. I also connected when you said, God, like in my life, I've had my battles with substance. And I said, God, there's no way I can do this by myself. You're going to have to do everything. I'm just going to believe you that you can do it. And so I understood you when you said that. Well, and that suddenly became possible yeah. and done. Well, I that. That, that, that thrills me, that makes my day. It's so wonderful to, to when we see um, examples of people you can actually talk to and know how God does intervene, how he promises to be with us through everything that he will never leave or forsake us and will stay closer than a brother and how he 
uh, has, uh, will give us a peace that passes all understanding, which is, but man, that's the definition what you just, what you, what you just experienced. Um, it's, it's so wonderful to actually see these examples of what the Bible promises that they'll do. And that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm visiting with y'all tonight, because the forgiveness that I experienced is available to everyone. Uh, and, and I just don't know how to do it yet, but I, I'm going to give you some, some thoughts on that. Amen. And I believe there's another person who had a, a comment or a question. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to commend uh, the gentleman for that act of forgiveness. Very deep. It's yes. clear that this can only be with someone who would have been with Jesus, who have really been with Jesus. Because Christ Himself, when He was on the cross, on the cross, He said, "Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do." And I think that it exemplifies what it is to be really with Jesus. However, um, the question is though, and I'm sorry I was driving, so maybe you would have answered it between spaces, and it, my uh, internet fell through. But do you have reflections on what would have happened? One. And two, do you think if you were not in Christ, you would have been able to forgive and move on with your life? Absolutely not. Now, if I, I knew the night of the shootings that I hated that person. I, I honestly, thoughts ran through my mind about if I could find out who it was and, and lock him in a room just hit him with a baseball bat until he was unconscious and wait for him to revive and do it again. I, I, I'm ashamed to say that, but that was one of the things I wanted to do. I want, he ruined my life and, and I didn't know why, but I just knew that I was, I hated him. And so no, if, if Christ hadn't met me that night in the hospital, and had played, not placed that opportunity in my mind to trust him when the Bible didn't make sense. I don't know what would have happened. I do know this. I, I would not have married my wife. She would not have, she would not have had me. She, first place, I would not have been uh, emotionally available uh, because that is one of the things that forgiveness does. It actually sets you free. It allows you an opera to be available because God has more plans for you. Mm. Your life may be in shatters right now, but God has a big picture and he has plans for your life. And to reach those plans, you have to get rid of the poison that's inside you. And wow, that's tremendous. That's forgiveness. Yeah. That is tremendous. Great. Great Thank Todd. you very much. You're Great welcome. insight. Great talk. Yeah. Terrence, I think they're not. Brother Terrence, you had a uh, Brother Terrence, I see your hand raised. You can ask your Hi, good evening and blessings, everyone, to Mr. Yes. Ken Whitaker. Thank you very much for sharing um, what I consider to be your testimony. And may God continue to be um, priority in your life. And I pray that others would eat understand your testimony and come to get to know the Christ that we serve. Um, I heard you said that that you were a Christian, that you you grew up in a Christian family. And of course, you, like most people during college years, there was a separation, but you got back into Christ. I would like to know, as you got your personal family, what was your, your son's relationship in watching him as it pertains to Christ, you also said, that's the first question, and you also indicated that you had a lot of wonderful memories in your home, and you just had one evening of um, that tragedy. Yes. And I would like to know, um, after, you, after you let me know about your son's relationship with Christ, where is he in Christ today? Has he accepted Christ? 
Um, did y'all speak about forgiveness? Has he forgiven himself? Um, can you answer those questions for me, please? Thank you. That's an excellent question. That's really, that, that, that gets to the heart of it. Um, growing up, Bart was a very happy, uh, very social, very friendly uh, kid. And there were, there were no examples of meanness or cruelty, um, just the opposite. And uh, he went through uh, well, the, the, the Methodist church, which is where we grew up, a liberal denomination, but uh, there was teachings and uh, he uh, accepted Christ and, and, and had, his, had uh, a, a second baptism. Uh, you know, we sprinkled him as babe, but this was his choice. To, and uh, when he was like nine or something like that. And we all, you know, up until the shootings, I would have said, well, okay, he's a Christian. He's slipped away a little bit in his high school years. Uh, and he acted a whole lot like I acted like when I was his age. And I just figured that, you know, time and life would, uh, but you know, knock some of those rough edges off, and and he would um, he would get in line just fine. But what we didn't know was that there was a uh, a, a very deep mental illness, and he disliked himself. He said he could not feel feelings like other people did. He wasn't sure what the proper reaction was when something happened. So he would watch other people, and over time, and he realized this early, and over time he built up this mask that he lived behind. And um, so he, he continued to dislike himself. You know, everybody else thought he was great. He was, he was fun, uh, he, he was super intelligent, but um, so, in answer to your question, I would have thought, and, and also uh, in, in, in John 10, Jesus talks about salvation and how he knows the, uh, the people that God has placed in his hand and no one can snatch them out. And then he says, and, and the Father knows those that are in his hand and no one can snatch them out. And I think of it kind of like this, where God and Jesus are holding tight to someone who has asked Christ to be their Lord and Savior. Uh, I know that there's differences of opinion, but I believe that once you choose and ask God to, or ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior and to you know, believe in your heart and confess with your lips that Jesus Christ is Lord, I believe that you are saved. You know, you may miss out on crowns that you you lose because your life didn't follow the Christian path. But I have been of the um, belief that you don't lose your salvation. I know that's some people believe differently. But if that's the case, then I believe that that Bart truly, as a child, accepted Christ. And if that's the case, then he sealed for heaven. But I don't know that. I don't know. I don't know if that decision was real or if that was part of his, his mask. So uh, I continue to this day to pray for him and to visit him and to support him um, by, I'm saying, by breaking the monotony of his, of his prison life. Uh, but it, as far as his faith right now, he... Uh, Kind of skates back and forth from being super angry at God for not helping him because he, he said that when he was young he asked over and over again for God to fix him. He said, I know something's wrong with me, fix me. Uh, but he did not experience that. So he goes from being super angry at God uh, to uh, acting like he doesn't care. But the truth is, and this gives me a great deal of hope. 
that uh, he feels now. He is so different than he was before. Uh, and I realized that you say, you know, he may just be fooling you. And that's true. He might. But Tanya has, a, has an incredibly sensitive antenna toward people and truth. And I've gotten better at it, too, especially since I know how he pulled the wool over us. I'm very cautious about it. But I believe that he has he is different and he's changed. And his heart is soft. And while he has not told me that he has... Uh, accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior since the shooting, uh, I believe that there's a chance that he will. And I'm praying that he will because I want his life to be full. I don't want it to be as empty as it is now. So it's, it's one of those things you never know. You never know what's really inside someone's soul and someone in their heart. But love means that you sacrifice. And so uh, I sacrifice my time and, and, and energies to uh, support him in the potential quest so that he will be standing before Jesus on Judgment Day. Maybe just one crown, but, but a crown. No. Well, listen, I want to jump into, and believe me, if there are more questions, I'll, I'm, I'll be glad to answer them because these have been really great questions. But I really want to jump into how the, some, some, some actual tools that you can use to uh, help yourself to uh, learn how to forgive. And I think it all begins with um, the acknowledgement that God wants to, to heal and to uh, bring, uh, he wants to redeem all of our stories, even December 10th. And the question is, are we going to let go of the offense and turn it over to him and allow him to do what he's promised to do for all those who call Christ as their Lord and Savior, which is to take that awful thing and work it for good. But that requires we let go of it. And that's hard to do because what we want like, is what I wanted the night of the shootings. And that was to um, see it. And that's what we do. We want to know that the person is paying a, a, a equivalent price to what we've had to pay for their actions. But it might be easier if we realize that nothing happens but what God allows it to happen. If it happens, it passes through his hands. Otherwise, God would not be all-powerful, all-loving, and all-knowing. Um, just, be, just because he allows something to happen doesn't mean that he caused it to happen. God did not cause that us nameless, faceless person to shoot that dear lady's husband. God, that wasn't his plan. December 10th wasn't his plan. Those, those things happen because broken people are making bad decisions by using free will in a fallen world. And God doesn't stop all of them. Sometimes he does, but he doesn't stop all of them. And when they, when God allows something horrible like that to, to happen, um, you're faced with the same decision I was faced with the night of the shootings, which was, is God in charge or not? Because I think God wants us to trust him in all of our losses, even if he never shows us why. He allowed them to happen in the first place. Because if we can ever accept in blind faith that he is going to take that loss and work it for good, if we can ever trust him to do that, then it changes everything. Because now we can have hope. And that hope comes from knowing that all of this pain can actually be used in a divine purpose in spite of itself. 
And and that just that just amazes me. That that always amazes me. Well, anyway, I got off. Uh, we were talking about how how to go about starting the forgiveness process. I think the very best way to start is to write a letter listing everything that the person has taken from you in detail, not just you ruined my life, but you ruined my life because my wife is gone. The woman that I plan to spend the rest of my life with, the woman I used to plan to grow old with, the woman that I used to uh, plan to retire with, the woman that we had all these plans to go trap, she's gone. You know, all of it. I'm not going to have grandchildren now. Boy, that hit me hard when I realized that for the first time. But you list everything that they have taken from you. And when you get to the bottom, you write, and I choose to forgive you for all of it, whether you can do that yet or not, okay? And then sign it. And you don't have to send the letter. I mean, the person may actually be dead. You may not know, like, like that dear lady, not know who... Uh, who to send the letter to. You don't have to know that. The important thing is that you write it out and that you sign it because signing it makes it a promise to yourself that you're going to do that. And writing it out, writing all those, those things out is important because you cannot forgive what you can't recognize and acknowledge. You can't forgive it if you don't put it down there and say, this is something I'm forgiving you for. So it's important. That letter is just, I've done this. I did this with Bart. I did this with the shooter. Uh, I actually was allowed to, to speak at the shooter's trial. The, one, the young man who actually killed Tricia and Kevin, who pulled the trigger. I was allowed to speak at his trial after everything was over uh, with a victim's impact statement. And I listed some of the things that his choices have taken from me. And I finished it by saying, you have, your choices have placed you in a very dark place. You know, your opportunities are now limited, but that doesn't mean that there are no opportunities. There are always opportunities to make your life worthwhile. And in an effort to help you make that choice, I want you to know that I'm choosing to forgive you for everything. And I was bawling. He was, he was shocked. And since I have, since then, I've learned that he has accepted Christ. So he is going to be in heaven. Yes. Yes. So at any rate, that letter is. Trust me, that, that is a wonderful thing. And if it takes you two weeks to finish writing that letter because it's so hard to, to uh, put it all down there at once, it's hard to uh, you know, fully take everything in at one time. And don't worry about it if it takes you a little while. Just plot on, keep going and finish it, right? Another way that uh, you can, you can uh, start the forgiveness process is what my wife Tanya calls praying backwards. You go to where you know God wants you to be, but you can't get there yet. And you pray that God would change you from the inside so that you want to forgive. You know, you might make a commitment to pray something like, you know, Lord, I know you want me to forgive. I can't do it yet. Please change my heart. Change me from the inside so that I want to want to forgive. You may have to pray that three times a day for two months or maybe two years, I don't know. But at some point, you know, there's a lot of prayers you don't know for sure that God is gonna answer. But if you're praying to the creator of the universe, the all powerful almighty God, that you want to forgive the person that hurt you, but you can't do it yet. And, it, and for him to change your heart, I think that's a guarantee. That's a prayer that's going to happen. You just have to, you just have to be consistent with it. 
But once you get those two things going to help you, I think it's also important to understand that there's a lot of misconceptions and misunderstandings about um, what, what forgiveness is. And the first one is that foolish old saying that, you know, if you're going to forgive, you got to forget. And that's, that's ridiculous. You know, we only forget things that are trivial. You may forget what you had for breakfast last week, but you're not going to forget some of those horrible things that happened. In fact, I think if you were able, were able to forgive, I mean, sorry, if you were able to forget some things, it would really be an example of denial and not forgiveness at all. Another thing um, that uh, you can do is to realize that forgiveness doesn't take them off the hook for the response, for the responsibilities for the things that they did. It doesn't, doesn't make it all right. It doesn't uh, let them off the hook for any consequences. I like to say that um, if your business partner steals from you, uh, you forgive them, but that doesn't mean that you have to stay in business with them. You create some healthy boundaries to protect yourself so that you don't make that same mistake again. Um, and in regards to that particular point, um, you played a pivotal role in getting the governor of Texas to commute your son's death sentence just a few hours before he was um, lethally injected. Yes. Um, and this was a governor who has never um, changed that position. He's never allowed anyone else. I mean, all of the 30 requests before your son uh, he's never intervened. He's never permitted anyone not to pay um, for their crime. Um, but in your case, he did. And you were a big part of um, getting that sentence commuted um, from death by injection to, to life imprisonment. Yeah. So as you were sharing that, I just want you to put that in context for us as well. Okay. Um, Bart... I'm a law and order guy to start with. I believe that, that people who step outside of the bounds of society and, and damage others have a responsibility and a price that, that they need to pay. And that's why we have laws. That's, that's our legal system. Um, so I never uh, tried to get Bart uh, to be released. That wasn't my intention. My intention was to give him life, allow him to live in case he had not yet made that decision to accept Christ as his savior. I wanted to give him time so that he could do that. Um, so I did campaign and the um, commutations of the death penalty in Texas are very rare. The last time that it happened before Bart's was 10 years earlier. And in between them, there had been 170 or 180 executions. So, um, and the parole board uh, who reviews the files and makes a recommendation to the governor, then the governor either chooses to listen to the recommendation or not. But the, the parole board, after reviewing all of the things that Bart had done positively in the 11 years he was on death row came to the unanimous conclusion that execution was the wrong thing, that incarceration for the rest of his life was, was a proper, was the proper penalty for what he had done. And I was very grateful for that. Honestly, two days went by before the governor chose to make his decision. And that was 30 minutes before, the, I mean, Bart was already strapped down in the gurney and they were ready to put the needle in his arm. So it was, it was down to the wire, but um, I was never trying to get him released. Yeah. Wow. I appreciate that, but it shows um, 
what grace and mercy yeah. and that he he who arranged to take your life you you pleaded and begged for his yeah i did i did um oh here's an here's i mentioned this earlier but perhaps one of the most important uh, uh, concepts to understand uh with um that I felt with the discussion of forgiveness is that it isn't something that you can do on your own. You require God's help to do it. Without God's power, you know, we, we won't do it completely. Um, you can tell that you've actually forgiven someone when you can pray a blessing for them. That's a pretty high bar, but that's the bar that Paul noted when he said, uh, you know, Pray for those who oppress you. Pray for them. Don't curse them. And uh, believe me, if you're if you're unable to actually pray a blessing for whoever hurt you, it, it might mean that there's a little more prayer you need to do to ask God to help you reach that point. Because mm -hmm. if there was ever an example of some of a proof that this is beyond human ability to do. It's that human nature is not going to pray a blessing over someone who took your wife and your son's life. But God, but with God, all things are possible. Mm -hmm. so, the last point that I wanted to make about uh, the process of forgiveness is that forgiveness in itself doesn't actually um, doesn't actually heal the wound. What it does is remove the poison, the, 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 the root of bitterness that the Bible talks about, which is a byproduct of the, the, the hatred and the decision to, to uh, pursue vengeance. Um, when we do that, uh, every single time our body cooks up a batch of emotional poison and it stays inside us until we either uh, dispel it through forgiveness or it becomes the um, new normal for our life by, by uh, seeping out and, and damaging all of our relationships, not just the one involved with that created it. All of our personal relationships are damaged when, when that leaks out. Um, but forgiveness is kind of the antiseptic that goes in and cleans out the poison. And once the poison is gone, God the Father can step in and say, I'm going to heal you now. But until that poison leaves, he can't step into that because he is holy. He isn't going to expose himself to sin. But boy, he is so happy when you ask him to help him clear that stuff out because his ultimate goal is to heal your broken parts. I just, is it okay to make a comment? Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to. Um, I, I connect with so much of what you're saying. Um, like during 9-11, I um, was so confused. And I, I talked about this previously in this, in this same forum, how when I saw that disaster, I said to God, I know you were not supposed to see you until the time comes. I know, but why would you let something like that happen? Why? It was, it was so, it was, it was uh, an amazing. And so my course, I stopped believing because I um, just couldn't imagine that God would let that happen. And like, that's when my faith was tested, like everything I've ever heard, every story of why we're here came falling off the shelf. And I was like, maybe this, or maybe that, maybe that's why. 
down the line, and it's like six months, eerie, eerie time of not believing and choosing to think that others, there's other reasons why we're here. Until it came back to me, like there's like just this little pilot still lid. And I learned about choice. And you said that and you wasn't, initially you were saying choice, but then you actually used the word. It was people's choice. Yeah. Not God let it happen, but the fact that we have choice to do things mm -hmm. and it affects other people. It certainly does. Then the thought of writing it down. I think the philosopher's name is Arapasto. He just, I don't, I'm not sure his name, but he says, can you have thought without vision? And for some reason, I kept, I wasn't able to see her. I would have the thought, but not see her. And I realized that it was somewhere in my psyche, like the lady was saying, that she didn't know who to, to blame or who to be angry at. So I think that because of that, I found that I just, blew up a helium balloon. And I didn't write to the person. I just wrote to my sister, everything that I will miss, all the plans we had, all of this, we had plans. All of that. that me and she was the last two of eight and we had plans. She was the one in front of me, taught me everything, did everything. So I wrote everything on a helium balloon. And just as I let it go and looked up and watched it disappear was similar to how I watched or with something in her, she disappeared. But, but, but of course, like we don't forget, but in the, in the heart, it was symbolic somehow. And that helped. Symbols are so important. God, they're so important. Uh, just, you know, writing that letter and signing your name is a symbolic, is it, but it's so powerful. And that balloon was a release of, uh, uh, you let go of, of that and to take it, God. And that's, you know, whether you do it with a balloon or whether you write the letter and you, and you throw the, and you burn it or you put it in your Bible and keep it or you go out to the you go out to the uh, cemetery and you sit there by by your wife's grave and, and you talk to her you know there's a lot of a lot of symbols that you can do that uh, help you get past that initial uh, emptiness in your heart and, and let Jesus start healing you from it. That's how it happened with me. Um, and I and I and I agree that once you could move out of the poison space, the space of hatred and anger, and once you can get moved and you don't move yourself, it is God. It surely is God that moves you from there. But once you do, you can begin to heal in yourself. But you surely, like, you won't forget. But when the poison is out, you can heal. And you never, you're never the same, but you do go on in life. And you still live a healthy life. Mm -hmm. But a different life than maybe what you would have lived. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you'll never go back to the same life, but there'll be a new normal, and the new normal is good. And I want to show you how God gave me a new normal, and how He proved that Romans eight twenty eight is real and works, because it wasn't like maybe three or four weeks after the shootings. I had a friend of mine named Laurie call me and said, Kent, I was, 
uh, I was reading Jeremiah today and I'm claiming a verse for you. And I'm thinking, well, nobody's ever claimed a verse for me that I know of, but I know I don't want you claiming anything from Jeremiah. Because that guy is bad news. It's everything he seemed like, to, everything he said was a downer because God was using him, wasn't he, as uh, Israel's conscience during the great uh, Babylonian captivity. So I could not imagine what, I mean, aren't I suffering enough? You're going to have to pick something from Jeremiah to claim for me. But the verse that she gave me was Jeremiah chapter 31. Verses three and four. And I'm going to tell you what it says. But before I do, I want to set the stage. God is talking to Israel. And he's telling Israel, listen, this isn't going to go on forever. There's a reason for this. And I love you so much. Uh, I am going to restore you. This isn't going to be the end. And here's what it said. it said. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. I will build you up again and you will be rebuilt. Once again, you will take up your tambourine and dance with the joyful. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, yeah, you can claim that for me because I want to dance again. I want to feel alive again. I want, I want that. And I told God, if he would heal me to the point where I could fall in love again, then I would bring a tambourine to, um, to my wedding reception. So I went out and I bought this one. I'm sorry. And I wrote the whole verse down. I'm sorry. Um, they were asking for the, the scripture reference again, please. Yeah. I wrote the scripture out on it and I hung it on my wall. And I must have looked at this thing thousands of times, always wondering, would it ever come true? Would that ever really happen? One. And it took five years and some really amazing mir miraculous connections. But God brought Tanya into my life. She lived in Dallas, four and a half hours away, 300 miles. But he brought her into my life. And when we got married, I don't see, I thought I had one out, but I guess I don't. Um, instead of leaving to rice or bubbles or rose petals or something, everybody had a little round uh, tambourine with Jeremiah 31, 3 and 4 written on it. And that was what everybody was waving as, as we left. And it was such an amazing, amazing thing that, that God was able to take uh, these two broken lives, because she had a big story too, and bring us together um, and, and heal both of us to the point where we could commit ourselves to a life of love and support for each other. But you know, it wasn't just me that, that benefited from uh, trusting in Romans 8.28. Uh, you know, and it wasn't just, you know, my healing all, all over. Uh, until the pandemic hit, Tanya and I would visit Bart um, once or twice a month. And because it's a long drive, it's a full day to get there and to visit and to drive back. Uh, but during that time, we, we were able to bring a great deal of light into his life. And prisons, if, if any of you have ever been in a prison, you know that it's a dark place. And uh, there's a lot of brokenness there, a lot of mental illness there. Uh, and by just going and being a presence there, it brings light. Um, here's another one. Here's another, here's another thing that, that uh, was healed. You remember the night of the shootings when, when Bart said that he was graduating and we used that excuse to get us out of the house? Well, 
while he was on death row, he told me, he says, Dad, I don't know how I'm going to be able to do this because on death row, we have, they have no access to phones or computers. Uh, they're held in solitary confinement 24 hours a day. Um, there really isn't even a, a real library that they have access to. But they can mail and receive mail. But he said, I'm going to try to find uh, a university and get my degree. I want to finish what I lied to mom about. And he did. He graduated summa cum laude. And when he got his diploma, uh, he said, you know, I think I want to go for my master's. And they're on death row where everything had to be done by mail. And believe me, a master's program requires a lot of uh, uh, connections with an advisor. And he got his, one of the few things that you can get a, um, a degree in online is, is uh, literature. <coughs> and so that's what he got his degree in. But <coughs> but he applied to the master's program at Cal State and was accepted. And um, shortly after his commutation, he was awarded his master's degree. At first, I thought that he would receive it posthumously, um, but he, he survived. So he got his bachelor's and his master's. And that's, that's, that's one thing that uh, is, is a huge blessing. And, and, uh, and I guess one of the biggest is the, um, the Pardons and Parole Board. I, we talked about that, about how they voted seven to zero to recommend commutation. And uh, that has happened. Uh, so the great news is that nobody, not even a murderer, you know, can, is beyond the arm of God's forgiveness. Um, see, our, we've talked a lot about, and, and I, what I hope everybody will understand is that our stories, regardless of how awful they are, are not always just about us. God allows us to experience some things so that we can be his eyes and feet. Uh, it takes different, different forms and different way in, with different things. In my case, I speak to people, you know, sometimes it's one and one, sometimes it's before a huge audience. But I talk about forgiveness. That's one of the things. It, it isn't always about you. And whatever has happened to you, there is another life available to you that's different, but just as sweet as the old one, just different. But to reach it, God has prepared it, but to reach it, you have to uh, have that poison cleaned out of your body by the, by the act of forgiveness. And when you do forgive, it sets you free. And I am, a, I am the perfect example of that. I hope that you've been able to see tonight that I'm, just, I'm a very happy guy. Even though all of this awful stuff has happened, but I'm happy because I know that Jesus is there, that there is a, a heaven, that he intervenes for us, even when the bad things are allowed to happen. And forgiveness is the key to so much. Uh, so it, it gives me great pleasure to, to be able to talk about it. Do you have any questions, um, Dr. Miller or anyone else? Any questions? Oh, come on. Somebody's got a hard question they want to ask. I said, I got a, I got a question. Um, Give me a hard one. I got a question. So, uh, not many questions, but I'm going to sit this one really burning. So, I mean, you, you struggled there in the hospital, right? Not knowing who it was. And if, like anyone else, you would want to kill that person, you know? Yes. Um, 
Yes. It being your son. Now, after the fact, if you thought about, I mean, I don't even know how to ask you, like it being like, say, a total stranger versus your son, um, how does that measure up? I mean, because you're talking about your son. Yeah. Your son killed your son and your yeah. wife and almost you. That That is, I just, I'm grappling with that. that. Does it make a difference? Does it make it easier, harder? That's really my question. I think that it doesn't matter the degree of the offense. And, and I think you'll have to admit that what Bart did to me was pretty high up there on the Richter scale. But if you are able to ask God to help you forgive and do the hard work of continuing to ask him to change you from the inside so that you can do that, writing the letters and, and saying, I want to forgive this. If you can do that, you're going to wake up one morning. I, this is going to happen. You're going to wake up one morning and you're going to realize, whoa, I don't feel that hatred anymore. What God did for me on the night of the shootings was he gave me a gift as a result of my decision to trust him when it didn't look like it made sense. He gave me the gift of forgiveness before I found out that it was my son. Because if I had not received that that night, and I had gotten to the very next morning and found out that he was not in school, that he, he wasn't about to graduate, I would have been so furious with him. I would have, I never could have gone home with him without condemnation and judgment and a sense of, of fear. But that's the thing about forgiveness. It, when I say it sets you free, I mean, it sets you free. I was, I was, those chains were gone. I wasn't, there was, there was no condemnation, even though I recognized that he, he may have been responsible. And if, if such, it was a very horrible thing. It didn't, like I said, it doesn't take away the consequences of their actions. All it does is it turns those consequences over to God for judgment. It's not up to me. And that's what heals you. That's what frees you. That's what gives you an opportunity to a new life. Because until, until that happens, you are going to be in bondage to that. I like to describe holding on to, to an offense like this. You know this. Your mind, when, when you focus on something, it becomes larger and larger and larger in your mind. It's kind of like looking at an ant through a magnifying glass or through a, uh, through a microscope. You look at that tiny little ant and all of a sudden it's big and it's all that you can see inside the, the lens. And that's what happens when you hold on to the offenses. They become bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where it is what you're focused on. And as long as you're focused on the loss, you will never be able to focus on the, the, the waiting new chapter that God has already got prepared for you waiting for you to be free enough to see it and accept it. So, yeah, if, if I had not had Christ in my, if, 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 if Christ had not met me that night in the hospital, uh, I never would have been able to have the relationship with my son that I did. Never. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty supernatural what I'm listening to because forgiveness is a process for most of us. Yes. Christians or otherwise, right? So the mere fact that you had that encounter and it took effect that quickly, to me, it's, that is, I, I can't even understand. I mean, how would I? But. Craig, I, mean, I don't understand it either. I really can't. It's a, it's just like any other miracle that God Jesus. I can't explain it. I can't explain healing. I have seen God heal people. And 
this is just another example of healing. It was a emotional healing instead of a healing to my neck, you know, mm -hmm. the herniated discs in my neck, which he healed. You know, I, if you can believe that God is able to heal uh, illness, it shouldn't be that hard of a stretch to believe that God is willing to heal your emotional scars too. Mm -hmm. What it requires, I think, and, and I've said this several times, I think what it requires is that we acknowledge that we're broken, that God wants to fix us. And as long as we hold on to the bitterness, he isn't going to be able to step in to, to clean that wound. You know, it's, it's, it doesn't make sense to me either, Craig. I honestly cannot explain it, but then I can't explain other miracles either. Yeah, but, but you're, 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 you're so right. And I think that a lot of times as believers, we tend to think that, uh, and, and I often refer to unforgiveness as the silent killer of our faith, similar mm -hmm. to that of high blood pressure. Yes. And we, we must understand it that, and I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that you brought out the fact that when we um, provide forgiveness, we are also healed emotionally. And a lot of times, that is why persons cannot live fulfilled really kind of enjoy fulfillment in relationships that's why they cannot um succeed even sometimes um professionally because basically unforgiveness is affecting them and so therefore it is incumbent upon us as believers to understand this that sometimes we wonder why this is happening why that is happening and sometimes it's the fact that we have not forgiven uh things that would have happened to us um, over the years, and like I said, it's the silent killer of our faith and also of our emotions as well. I love that. And by the way, uh, I have this, I have the, the, the faces on these tiny, tiny little screens on my small computer screen. And I, I think I called you Craig, and I don't know if it was Chris or Craig that, that was speaking just then, but... That's uh, Chris. Chris was just speaking. Okay, I apologize for calling you Craig. Oh, you, you call Craig. That, right that's there. fine. That's my brother. But Craig was speaking before me. Okay. All right. Good deal. <laughs> so I, I, I kind of had a two-part question. Sorry. I don't know if you finished explaining Chris's comment. Uh -huh. are, you, are you finished explaining Chris's comment? I, as best I can. Okay. So, so after that encounter with God and that quick, what I call a quick response from God, and I've seen his works. Trust me. I've, I've seen him heal the dead. Um, or brought the dead back to life. I've seen that with my bare eyes. Wow. Um, but but so so it's not a matter of my faith and believing. It's just, I guess, it's like you said earlier, it's it's an individual relationship between you and God. So I I I, I wouldn't, I'm not gonna try to understand the process in there when you were in the hospital watching your your God forgive me for saying it's your dead wife on the bed and and you know having to grapple with how do you move on, right? I that's between you and God. So in that moment, um, did you understand that you've received forgiveness or you've had it in your heart for whoever it was? Did you understand that there was a purpose behind of that? Did I understand what? That there was a purpose. Oh. One, you, you, were, you were alive. Two, you, <laughs> you have to forgive whoever this was and you didn't have a clue that it would be a son. At, at that time, no, I did not understand there there was a purpose at all i didn't understand any of it i didn't know why it happened i didn't know what was going to come i didn't know what my life was going to be like i didn't even know if i was going to be able to survive you know emotionally but you know but you knew you had to forget which yeah. is a tall order i mean you, you you know we're talking about your wife and your kids so if you accept the fact that okay i got to forgive this person uh, I'm just trying to figure out where your mind was at that point, at that point that, okay, you know what, I'm going to do this, God, I'm trusting you. Okay, this is purpose-driven, right? It's not just, you're not just doing this just because you have a relationship with God. God has, I'm thinking, this is me thinking out loud, God has a purpose for you. I mean, did you, did that cross your mind? It was, it was just too much going on at the time. There was too much going on. 
there was, you know, um, the thing about grief is that it robs your mind. It, it makes, mm -hmm. they call it woolly headed. Uh, you can't think clearly. You forget stuff like crazy. You're tired all the time. Um, so there were a lot of, lot of things that I was not thinking about at the time. All I was thinking about was uh, how awful I felt, how sad I was, how broken everything was. And uh, I, was, I felt numb because the, uh, the grief was overwhelmingly hard. It wasn't until later uh, I went by that I was put some things into perspective and say, oh, okay, that's why I was let, allowed to tell. Uh, or, oh, uh, uh, let me know. Mute, mute, mute. Sir? Sorry, go ahead. No, that's, uh, was I cutting out? No, yeah. that was. You're good now. You're okay. good. Okay. Well, Craig, I don't know if I if I answered your question or not, but I will tell you that uh, the. No, you did. You did. You did. I, 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 you, there was a lot going on. You, you couldn't grasp it, but now you have clearly, I mean, you've. Yep. You know, coming on the study tonight and, and breaking this down for us, I mean, that is, um, I'm grappling with that. Like, like, I mean, again, that's between you and God and the purpose that he has for you, you know? I mean, it's obviously changed lives. And I know most of us tonight, um, you know, can, can walk away with something from this. Well, I hope so, because that's the only reason I'm here, is to be an example to those who don't know that it's possible to truly heal from loss. Yeah. And one of the, the questions that was um that was um placed in the chat is that for for um for this individual he's saying that the hardest person he ever had to forgive was himself. Mm. How how um what do you say to that person? How do you forgive yourself? That's an awesome question, and that's one that usually comes up. In fact, I I usually address that when I'm speaking. Um, when it isn't an interview situation like this. But quite often that's the case. In fact, I'm, I venture to say that everybody struggles with forgiving themselves for some things. Everybody. And here's my answer to that. God wants to heal all of our broken parts. I've said that a dozen times. And he does not want Satan to limit us. If we are Christians, we believe that God has forgiven us for all of our sins when we ask Jesus to take them on his back. When we confess our sins and, and say, Jesus, you're my Lord and Savior. Thank you. I believe you in my heart that you died and were raised from the dead for my sin. When we do that, my understanding of the Christian faith, you know, is that you know we're forgiven and if that's the case and you hold on to uh beating yourself up for something that you have asked god to forgive you for then who do you think you are you're you're holding yourself out as being more important in the judgment uh, process than god himself because god has clearly forgiven you he says he has he says, I not only forgave you, man, I threw it in the ocean on the, as far as east is from the west. I don't even remember it anymore. And you're drag, dragging it up every day? Mm -hmm. pray, pray that same prayers, but with just a word or two different. Father, I know you want me to forgive myself because I am, by holding on to this, I am limiting the opportunities that you have actually created and are waiting for me. But I'm limiting myself and I'm keeping myself away from those because I'm holding on to beating myself up for something that I acknowledge was an awful mistake. I know it was horrible, 
but you have forgiven me and I need to forgive myself. So change my heart so I'm able to let this go. I want to be the person that you have uh, in mind, that you have planned for. You, you died to give me new life. Well, right now I'm still holding on to the old one. And I, I need you to cleanse my heart, help me to forgive myself so that I can become that new man. Well, good evening, everybody. I just want to say blessings and thank you, um, Mr. Ken, for coming on this evening. Um, definitely been blessed um, by your testimony and thank about you. your family. Um, you know, as you were just speaking, you know, there's always been showing me that he definitely prepared you for your faith from the time you um, with, with Trisha at first. The Lord actually did build your faith. So when you came to that time, you know, and you had that discussion with God while well, you already shot. You know, God was just taking you at that point from that faith. It was a crossroad that you had at that point right there when you got shot, when you made that decision with that uh, Romans 8, 28. And because you held on to it and asked God to help you, it seems on your obedience and your faith with him that he just blanket you with that blessing of forgiveness. And I was like, my God, I said, Lord God, thank you for this man. Thank you for just blessing him. And when you came back home, what you were explaining was that your friend had cleaned up the house, you know, so it had went back to how it was. And when you said that, I said, wow, it's also powerful to have others to help you in the process and how they help the clean to make everything back to normal to some degree. Mm -hmm. And the thing about it was, you balanced that one bad event from all the good memories that you had treasured. You know, God allowed you to balance it and keep it correct. Because if you had let that one night negative whole thing, it would have made all the positive that you had with your previous um, family, you know, where you reeled down. And then when you got married to um, Tanya, you realized and recognized also that you want to create new memories with her. That's the reason why you have to move from out of the house. That's what the Holy Spirit was showing me. And I said, my God, for him to start new memories and blessing treasures. I said, God, thank you for him. Bless him. Let God continue to bless you and Tanya greatly. I don't even know you, but I love your love of God. God bless you, Ken, and, and your family. God bless. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank you all. This has been delightful. Uh, I only have one thing that I'm unhappy about. And that is that I'm having to do this on Zoom instead of being there in the Virgin Islands. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know that would have been more perfect. <laughs> Everybody's one, of these one, of these. one of these days. But yes, it will. This has been a, yes, a, an honor. God's uh, God, we really, we really um, love to have you in his divine purpose, you and Tanya as well. And as we close, um, because that is the the new chapter of your life, just kind of share with us how your relationship and ministry with Tanya um, has helped with the healing process. Yeah. Uh, were you asking me to, for something I, I, I missed? Yeah, I said, yeah, no, as, as we are closing out, just share with us briefly how your relationship and ministry with Tanya has helped with your healing process. Okay. Um, well, that's a... That's another hour and a half right there. <laughs> but uh, Shot version, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I have I have been retired for a while, so I don't really have a a paying job. But what I am is the husband of a pastor. <laughs> I'm a pastor's husband, and. Um, my wife is the uh, executive pastor in charge of ministries for our church, and uh, it's a big job. I mean, it's a 7,000 member church, so there's a lot of ministries, and I get to play with that. I get to be, that's my job. I get to be her helper, and while I can't do a whole lot of stuff, one of the things that I am able to do is... Uh, her favorite thing is, is, is teaching women. She loves to teach the Bible to women. 
and she has all her life. And from the time that we got married, she started at our church uh, and she earned her uh, bona fides by service and by teaching. And she became a, a very popular teacher to the point where uh, before COVID, um, there would be 600 women that would come every week to a Bible study she had. Uh, now, admittedly, there was there was four sessions. <laughs> we got to the 600 with four sessions. There's uh, a, a morning and an evening session at our at our main campus, and that was about 500 people. And then there was we have two other campuses, and between them there was a couple of hundred. Uh, or maybe there's more at, at, at the main campus and a little less. But anyway, uh, it was a big, big group. And because it was so big, we couldn't hold it anywhere except in the worship center. So every week that uh, of the eight weeks in the fall and eight weeks in the spring when she did this, um, our facilities group would move all the chairs, 900 chairs out of the out of the down part of the downstairs part of the uh, worship center and roll in 40 tables and put eight or 10 chairs around each of the tables and they would be small groups. So the women would come and stay in that same group for eight weeks with the study. Tanya would teach it for 30 minutes and then they would uh, meet in their group for 45 minutes or an hour and answer questions and go through things kind of like what we did tonight. Uh, but because it was in the main worship center, all of the cameras were available, and it was a—it's a big church, and we're online, so we have uh, four really, really nice cameras, plus a couple of satellite cameras, and so I put together a volunteer media team of, of people that just like doing this, and so every Wednesday morning and evening they come. And we have a, a three camera crew plus a, a, a media person plus a, a director in this in the secret control room, and I am the lighting and, and audio guy. So we we actually are able to um, go take those, and uh, I'll give uh, Pastor Carl a, uh, a connection if anybody wanted to check out my wife and, and her. Uh, one of her messages. Yeah. So anyway, that's one of the things I get to do. And I love it. It is a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you so much. We're going to have to agree with you a little bit. Um, I think Brother Terrence wants to have something you want to share. And Sister Carolyn as well. Okay. Um, thank you. I posted it in the chat, but I was wondering if um, there were any plans or have you been approached to write a book and or a movie, a Christian faith-based movie concerning um, your life experience and testimony? Actually, that I, I did. I did write a book. And it started out as um, basically just uh, my grief counselor wanted me to do some journaling. So I wrote down some things and some events and as I was processing them. And she said, this is really good. You ought to string these together into a book. And I said, no, 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 no. The last thing in the world I want is publicity. I, I am sick of cameras in my front yard. I'm sick of being on the news in the, at night. I just want to disappear into the crowd. I, I, want, to, I, I want to be uh, just, what? I, I want to be I want to be lost in the crowd. But she said, well, you know, there's a lot of people who, who struggle with forgiveness. Um, you ought to go to a writer's conference just to see what that's like. And so I did, and I, I liked it. I have always enjoyed writing. So I wrote a book, and it got picked up by a publisher. And uh, it actually made the New York Times bestseller for a little while. But I, when I first decided that I was going to maybe consider writing a book, I decided I was not going to profit from it. I did not want anybody to say, yeah, well, he wrote a book about this and 
lined his pockets. So every, every nickel of royalty that I got from the sale of that book, and there were was a lot of books sold, um, I, I gave to charity. And I'm, I'm so glad I chose to do that. But um, I did write a book and uh, it's the, uh, <laughs> I called it 70 times seven. That was my working title. Uh, Cause that's an allusion to uh, Jesus. When Jesus was asked, how often do we need to forgive? He said 70 times seven, which basically means don't stop. You must forgive forever. But the uh, Simon and Schuster didn't like that title. They said nobody would know what that meant. So they said, because you wrote it uh, as a Christian book aimed at a secular readership. So it wasn't full of Christianese. It wasn't, the Christian message was front and center all the way through it, but it wasn't one of those things where you count people on the head with it. And they said, we're going to push this for the secular market. So they came up with the title Murder by Family, which I thought, whoa, whoa, I don't know that I like that at all. But they said, no, they said, if you want to reach the secular market, Seven. it's got to be a catchy title like that. Yeah. And so basically, the point, the, the, the purpose for the book was to get it in the hands of as many people who didn't know the gospel as possible. I wanted the Christians to read it. The Christians already know that the path to, to uh, life with God the Father forever is through Jesus. They already know that. But a lot of people who are into crime books, you know, don't. So anyway, that's how it was. It's, um, it was uh, Oprah read it. Or Oprah, when I was on, on Oprah's show, she mentioned it four times, which is the publisher said she never does. Usually there's, if she wants for sure, if you're lucky twice, but because she mentioned it four times and because of that hour long program, uh, that's that's what pushed it into the New York Times bestseller list. Yeah. So, thank you, Oprah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's, it's beautiful that that one is going to change lives by giving it to charity. So we honor you for having that heart uh, for God in his kingdom. May God bless you for that. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And so that is that we're going to have our co-host, uh, Dr. Carolyn Miller, close us out. We truly enjoy our time with you, Kent, uh, as well as our live audience who's been with us all through the fall. We're getting ready to break for the Christmas holidays. We love you. Merry Christmas. Enjoy the season. The next time you'll be hearing our voices will be sometime mid-January going to February. Uh, but before we do, I'd just like Dr. Carla Miller to say um, a few closing words, um, say a little bit about um, the book, and, and and just close us with a word of prayer as well. Kent, you you feel like family, yes. and um, we, in the Bible says you you speak your desires, and God will want to bring them to pass. Mm -hmm. And so you have friends and family in the United States Virgin Islands who will see what we can do to bring you down with Tanya. Uh, to this part of the world, uh, both, both St. Thomas and Anguilla, because we have our, our sister church as well, Christian Fellowship Church in Anguilla. Uh, we would just love to have you, even if it's just to hang up and spend some time with us. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for accepting our invitation. God bless you. Thank you. Okay, Pastor Carl, I will say a couple of words, but I don't want to close us out because I'm too close to crying and I've been holding it in. And you know that gets ugly we don't have time for that <laughs> we don't have time. but i do want to say thank you to kent oh my gosh it i never get tired of hearing your story and hearing um you know the god in you and the god in us you know i never get tired of that and i so appreciate you taking the time to minister to us tonight um, your seeds have fallen on good soil and I am believing that we will see a hundredfold return <laughs> yeah I told you it gets ugly so um, I'm going to pass it back to you Pastor Carl before I just 
go. But thank you, Kent, and we love you. And we love Tanya. We look forward to seeing you in Houston and in St. Thomas. That's correct. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and just one more um, thing, um, Kim, before I um, close out. Uh, where would they get the book if they were interested in, in um, purchasing your book? What's the best place? The best, the best way to get it, uh, <clears throat> it's not in bookstores anymore. You know, books don't have, they don't, they don't last that long. Uh, and that was in 2008 and 2009. So the best way, if you would like to get the book, the best way to do it is to go on Amazon and um, look for, you know, Murder by Family. Okay. And it, it will probably be a used book, but uh, that's okay. Somebody bought it and, and the royalties went, but, uh, and I get a little bit from, from the used book sales. So that'll go too. But anyway, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so we thank you so very much for being here with us. We thank you for your time um, is valuable. And um, I know um, it was a blessing for me personally to hear that forgiveness is possible, that even for the difficult things, that the difficult stories that we may think would be unforgivable, that it is possible when we follow God's word and we follow his principles. And as you truly um, outline for us tonight, it is a process. Um, it's a miracle when it can happen instantly like it did for you and for the others of us who might be struggling to know that it is still possible to do it. And just, you know, just release, as you said, that to Christ and he will be able to work it out for our good. And so we pray tonight, oh God, for each and every soul who have heard. As they, as we have listened to this story, oh God, we pray first of all for, um, for Kent and for Tanya and for their family, oh God, and for Bart, oh God, and everyone else who's involved, oh God. We thank you, oh God, that you have, um, you have displayed love through Kent um, to him and to the rest of this world, God. And we know, God, that if you can do it through his story, you can do it to ours. Ours might not be the same, but it's similar. And with all things, oh God, but when it causes hurt, it is necessary to be forgiven and to extend forgiveness. And so we ask you to help us, oh God, from these times of studying your word to realize that it is necessary, that it is a step that is important for us to heal. And we pray, oh God, that after studying it for this time, that this would, would cement that truth, oh God, and we will just get to the place that we'll just do it. Do it not in our own strength because we realize that's not possible, but do it with the strength of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, O oh God, for your love. And we pray even now, O oh God, for that person who may have heard this story and realize that the first thing that's important is that they need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because without that, it would not be possible for Ken to forgive or even for us to forgive. Who much is forgiven, much is expected to be forgiven. And so we ask, O oh God, that if they don't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, that even from this meeting tonight, that they will realize that that void and that step is necessary. And so we pray that you will just minister to them, that they will realize that all they have to say is, God, I'm a sinner. I've re released my sins unto you, and I ask you to come into my heart and save me. And if they do that, oh God, and they believe in the faith, it will come to pass, and you will save them. And then the next step would be that the same forgiveness that you grant to them, they can extend to others. And so, God, I pray for that soul. I pray for for um, the, the heart and person, oh God, those who have lost, oh God. We know, God, that it is a great loss, but we also know that your love can replace it and offer even much more. So we thank you for everything, oh God. We pray that as we break for our Christmas holidays, that even during this time, that is a good time. It also could be a time where these memories can come back up. So we pray that they'll be replaced, oh God, with good thoughts, oh God, and that we just have a great time with our families and friends and bring us back together again. And Jesus, name I pray. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Have a wonderful evening. Thank it was you. Nice being with you. Bye bye. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks for being here, everyone. And happy holidays. Happy holidays. Thank you. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome, Melinda. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you.